Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Uh, this is a hearing of both the Subcommittee uh, on Investigations and Oversight and the Subcommittee on Energy uh, and Environment of the uh, Science and Technology Committee. Uh, we will have another hearing uh, that is a joint hearing of the two subcommittees on Thursday this week. Uh, today's hearing is entitled the Department of Energy Support for the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory Part 1. Uh, an enormous amount of effort uh, has gone into uh, undermining support for a very small uh, but very important ind independent laboratory. The Savannah River Ecology Lab uh, housed at the Savannah River nuclear site since 1931 uh, and run by the University of Georgia has uh, an impressive record of scientific contributions to environmental sciences. Uh, headquarters staff at the Department of Energy right up to uh, the former head of uh, Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs, the current Deputy Secretary and the Secretary himself uh, have all played a role in uh, trying to eliminate funding from the Department of Energy for the lab. Um, the overall budget of the Department of Energy is $26 billion. The total funding uh, for the laboratory has been about $4 million. I certainly don't want to say that uh, $4 million is too little on the amount for, uh, for the executive branch to sweat. Uh, we certainly want them to be concerned about amounts of that, uh, of that size. Um, but it is somewhat, uh, to give you a benchmark or a purpose of comparison, a few weeks ago we heard that the uh, administrator of NASA spoke to the uh, Inspector General staff uh, and told them not to bother with investigations uh, except investigations into fraud and only investigations in fraud, into fraud that would result in savings of, of at least a billion dollars. Uh, less than that just wasn't worth the trouble. Um, so it is curious that the Department of Energy with a uh, $26 billion a year budget uh, has spent so much attention on an independent lab that receives about $4 million a year in funding. Uh, and why the question becomes why. Uh, the question could also be asked about this committee. Why are we holding uh, this hearing? And it is part one. There will be further hearings on, uh, on this laboratory. And the reason for our interest is that we care um, uh, that although the lab is small and the amount being expended is small relative to the federal budget, uh, the scientific importance of the lab has been enormous. Uh, it has certainly been enormous in the work that they do in radiation measurements and, and detecting uh, the effect of radiation uh, at a time when we are worried about a, a dirty bomb as the most likely form of a terrorist attack. Uh, it is certainly important when we are looking at uh, almost certainly relying more on nuclear energy uh, in the near future uh, than we have. Uh, the, the importance of a lab that does ecological research into the effect of radiation uh, is very important. Uh, scientific research has been the core mission of the lab for most of its 51 years. Um, it is hard to put a price tag on the value of the lab's research. Uh, the lab has contributed to the mission of the Department of Energy uh, on the site uh, in very direct ways. The, the, the documents that we will enter into, uh, enter, enter into the record of the day um, and the story of, our, of the former director, Dr. Paul Birch, uh, will tell uh, uh, will tell, the story they will tell will make it abundantly clear that department managers at the site value the lab uh, for all of its contributions. Uh, and the lab does play an essential role in the Savannah River site's need to meet uh, environmental regulatory compliance requirements. Uh, compliance requirements under the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Comprehensive Environmental uh, Response Compensation and Liability Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. Uh, and the lab has also helped the Savannah River site a National Environmental Research Park through public education and tour uh, efforts. Uh, the lab conducts environmental outreach programs that, uh, for the Department of Energy that give the site more credibility in the eyes of folks in the community around the site uh, because it is, in, it is independent and they think they can trust uh, what the lab has to say. Uh, in all those ways and more, the lab uh, is essential to the functioning of the Savannah River site uh, and uh, certainly appears to be worth uh, every bit of the $4 million the Department of Energy uh, has spent on it in the recent past. Uh, but the folks at the Department of Energy's headquarters uh, believe differently. 
they thought that the uh, the best the best face to put on face to put on uh, the conduct of the Department of Energy over the last several months has been that they directed uh, the local site manager Jeff Allison uh, and his staff to negotiate with the lab um, in bad faith uh, to uh, to change the rules to change the purposes to change the objectives uh, frequently uh, and to leave the lab dangling uh, without uh, funding to continue. Uh, they never told the lab exactly what was happening, uh, but they stepped in, the headquarters, DOE headquarters stepped in uh, to guarantee that the lab would not receive the resources necessary to keep it operating. Uh, headquarters actions left the Department of Georgia halfway through a fiscal year uh, to figure out whether to close the lab or let it limp along uh, to fill out remaining federal grants from other agencies. Uh, and the department washed its hands of the outcome and misrepresented everything they have done uh, to anyone who has asked, uh, the public, the press, and Congress. Uh, these conclusions are not uh, based on hearsay. They're not based on speculation. Uh, they're based upon a review of the documents, uh, the department's own materials. Uh, and many of those materials are being made public today. Uh, and the public and public scrutiny for the Department of Energy's conduct with respect to the Savannah River Lab is long overdue. Uh, just as an example, the task that the Department of Energy asked the lab to submit in February went through a what was called a technical peer review, um, among other places, in a letter to Representative Barrow uh, and a statement from a Department of Energy spokesman that was uh, prominently placed in local news. The task uh, supposedly went through scientific peer reviews, uh, but no peer review of any kind ever occurred. The Department of Energy staff now concedes that. Uh, a different kind of review uh, was done at the behest of the headquarters, uh, one that seems uh, unprecedented and uh, invented solely for the occasion and solely to produce the outcome of closing the lab. Uh, the headquarters instructed the site to evaluate each task on whether it met a mission critical need in 2007, this year. Uh, no one at the lab knew what that meant, and most of the research that they have done over their 51 years has been long-term research, uh, not research designed to, to bring an immediate result. Uh, and it appears the Department of Energy uh, meant by that uh, only research done to do immediate cleanup, uh, and no other research performed at the lab was worth funding. Uh, the process appears to be designed to reach a, a result, uh, and the result was to close the lab. Uh, no science lab in the country uh, does research that pays dividends in the next six months. Uh, that is just not what science is about. Uh, a handful of people at headquarters uh, really eviscerated the lab uh, a lab that is internationally renowned for work uh, that has saved the taxpayers millions, maybe billions of dollars. Uh, and the question is why? Uh, why have they worked so hard to close a lab uh, that receives, has received $4 million a year? Is it really about the $4 million? Uh, we will hear from the department uh, at a next hearing. Uh, Mr. Clay Sell uh, has agreed to appear. He agreed to appear today, uh, but his schedule uh, personal circumstances have made that impossible, so we will hear from him at a later date. I know there are some folks from the Department of Energy here today observing the hearing. Uh, we welcome you, and uh, we hope that we do receive all the documents that we have requested uh, in time to review them thoroughly before Mr. Uh, Sell does testify. Um, and we look forward to hearing the Department to explain uh, their side of events. Uh, I would now like to recognize Mr. Nick Lamson, distinguished chairman of the Energy and Environmental uh, and Environment Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Miller. Uh, I uh, think it's uh, excellent that our uh, Committee on uh, Energy and Environment joins the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight uh, for this uh, very important uh, uh, hearing. I certainly concur with all of the things that, uh, uh, that you've said here today. And certainly, uh, we're, we're here to attempt to solve a mystery. A uh, mystery involving the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, SREL, uh, a laboratory associated with the University of Georgia and located uh, on the Department of Energy's Savannah River site. Well, what is SREL? Uh, it's a laboratory whose work has saved the taxpayers millions of dollars in remediation costs, a laboratory that has the confidence of the local communities in South Carolina and Georgia adjacent to the Savannah River site, and the enthusiastic support of the Citizens Advisory Council associated with the site, 
a laboratory that has been in existence since the 1950s when the Savannah River site was established. It was founded by one of the nation's foremost and eminent ecologists, Dr. Eugene Odom, and it has maintained invaluable, continuous, long-term data sets on important animals and plants. This laboratory, in conjunction with the University of Georgia, has trained hundreds of environmental scientists and has run popular and successful public education and outreach programs on the Savannah River site. SREL has also assisted the site in its efforts to comply with federal and state environmental laws. It also manages one of the seven national environmental research parks in a network of ecologically important sites that exist on DOE property across the country. The Savannah River Ecological Laboratory has provided these services to the taxpayers of this country at a cost of less than $10 million a year. Well, this is a record of achievement that any organization would be proud of and certainly one that deserves recognition. And what is their reward for those 50 years plus of service? Well, they have certainly been recognized by the DOE headquarters. They have been unfortunately rewarded with a loss of funding in the middle of the fiscal year leading to layoffs and essentially the closure of the laboratory, a move that places the ongoing research and the continuity of long-term data sets in grave jeopardy, bad faith bargaining and the renewal of a cooperative agreement with their federal partner, the Department of Energy, and the dismissal of the laboratory's director, apparently by personal request of the Secretary of Energy to the President of the University of Georgia. I simply do not know what to make of it. I feel as if I am in the middle of Wonderland with Alice. The callous treatment of the employees of SREL is disgraceful. Beyond the hardship inflicted on them by the sudden and unexpected job loss, this decision is absurd. It is not in the interest of the people of South Carolina and Georgia, the Savannah River site, the Department of Energy, or the rest of this nation. And we have witnesses with us today who will be able to begin to tell us about this laboratory, its history and its work. Dr. Paul Birch, the former director of the lab, will be, uh, will be able to tell us about the events of the past few years that have brought us here today. We'll hear from the Department of Energy at another hearing, but I am not confident that we will ever fully understand why the headquarters of the Department of Energy has spent a great deal of time and effort to close a world-class laboratory with an excellent record of service to the department, to the nation, and to the local community. And I believe the ultimate reasons for this absurd and ill-advised decision may be and continue to be a mystery that will not be able to solve. Hopefully, though, we will reverse this decision and restore this laboratory so that it may continue its good work. And I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lamson. The, now, uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Sensenbrenner for an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Now, I had a prepared opening statement that I was prepared to read into the record. Uh, after hearing both the distinguished chair from North Carolina and the other distinguished chair from Texas, let me state that I'm really disturbed that what appears to be a piece of bad faith on one side is being reciprocated with another piece of bad faith right here on the other side of the aisle. The Deputy Secretary of the Department of Energy had to leave town for a funeral. Uh, we can't help those kinds of things. Uh, sometimes we have to leave town for funerals as well, uh, whether it's a family member, or, you know, a very close personal friend, or a mentor, or something like that. And there was a request that was made of the majority staff to postpone this hearing until Mr. Sell could come on back to be able to testify on behalf of the Department of Energy on why the decisions were made. The majority rejected that uh, request. And I think that that in and of itself is unfair. Now, after hearing both Mr. Miller and Mr. Lamson's opening statement, I think the purpose of the hearing is now clear. It's not to investigate the contributions of SREL, something that all of the witnesses that are here can testify to, and I think which is not at the heart of the controversy. 
the purpose of this hearing is to attack the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy, and specifically uh, Deputy Secretary Clay Sell, isn't able to be here to be able to defend itself. Now, I've heard from the other side of the aisle that we're going to go to the expense of having a second hearing, uh, where Mr. Sell will come on in and testify sometime later on. That's not really necessary. And I think the purpose of having an investigation is to be able to hear both sides of the argument. Now, the argument, I don't think, is the contributions that SREL has made over the years. Uh, that really is, is not the issue. The issue is a disconnect between the Department of Energy people who were on site at SREL and the headquarters office of the Department of Energy that apparently made the decision to discontinue the funding. And the attack that I've heard from both of the distinguished chairmen um, can't fairly take place when DOE can't be here to defend itself. Uh, the witness did have to leave Washington to go to a funeral, and it simply is not fair for this hearing to proceed without DOE being able to, to be present. Um, you know, I come to these hearings like this with an open mind, but when there is a procedural overreach, and there clearly is a procedural overreach in the case of this instance uh, because of Mr. Sell's necessity to go to a funeral, uh, I would ask the two distinguished chairs to postpone this hearing so that we can hear about all these issues in one hearing. And if you don't do so, I think that shows that you folks are hell-bent to hang DOE in a time when DOE cannot be there to defend itself. And I yield back the balance. May, may I interrupt for one second? And well, I, I, the yield the, I yield to the chairman. And, and, well, for, it, that, and Mr. Simpson-Runner, I, I certainly agree that uh, Funerals of family members or close family friends uh, or close friends uh, is something we should respect. Um, but what you just said, I'm advised by our staff, is not correct. Uh, the Department of Energy did not request that the hearing itself be postponed, um, only that Mr. Sell be excused from appearing today. Well, um, I'm requesting, reclaiming my time, I'm okay. requesting that the hearing be postponed uh, because uh, I think that. Uh, uh, to use kind of a trite phrase that we hear on one television network, we ought to be fair and balanced. And we can't be fair and balanced because Mr. Sell is attending a funeral. Uh, if you want to be unfair and unbalanced, go ahead. I think we ought to be fair and balanced. And uh, when I held investigative hearings, I always had people on both sides testify. And if they couldn't come, we rescheduled the hearing so that everybody could see exactly what the issues were, starting with the committee members. Uh, well, Mr. Sensenbrenner, you were not part of the telephone conversations that I was part of with the Department of Energy, and if you were the impression that they were eager to have Mr. Sell come and appear before this committee, um, it, my, my experience is no, that that is not the case. Well, reclaiming uh, my time, of course, when we're investigating them, they're not eager to have somebody appear before the committee. My point is, is we ought to listen to both sides, and by going ahead well, with this hearing, you're not going to listen to both sides. All right. I, my immediate concern is the convenience of several witnesses who have come to Washington today. Um, Mr. Lamson, you, you wish to be recognized as well. Well, I, and that's the point. Well, I, 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 it's my time, and I yield the gentleman from Texas. Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, I, uh, too, was concerned about the, the folks that had already been scheduled. Uh, and I just wanted to, to ask uh, of whom we had, had heard or to whom the uh, statements from the Department of Energy were directed so that we could know about the request for postponement. And it's going to be only a postponement. We will have Mr. Sell here on August the 1st. Oh, reclaiming my time, uh, this all goes to show that because uh, the majority wants to attack the Department of Energy, I guess we're going to have two hearings to attack the Department of Energy when we could very easily have done it with one um, and have uh, both sides speak and have both sides on the witness stand at the same time and members of the committee can ask questions to, to actually get to the bottom of this. From everything I know, the problem is is DOE headquarters. It's not the DOE personnel that's down at SREL. And the only way we're able to get DOE headquarters so to be able to testify knowledgeably is to have Mr. Sell here. I, I, I've made my point. Uh, it's now up to the majority to decide whether we're going to have a fair and balanced hearing or not, and I see my time's up.
Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Um, Mr. Inglis. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, I, I do uh, recognize the uh, significance of Mr. Sensenbrenner's questions. I think they, they're they well placed before this uh, committee, before the chair, as to why the um, hearing goes forward. Um, it is, uh, I think, uh, important to get to the bottom of these things. I wish that we were having a uh, balanced hearing here. Um, and uh, it's important to find out what's going on. That for more than 50 years, uh, the Savannah River Ecology Lab in, at the University of Georgia has been a helpful resource, as I understand it, to the Savannah River site. Um, Savannah River um, Ecology Lab's uh, research projects and educational outreach activities help Savannah River site understand the ecological impacts of the site's operations. Um, today we'll hear from several witnesses, not uh, as many as we'd like to hear from, um, who uh, will attest to the usefulness of um, the uh, lab's projects both to SRS and to the surrounding community. And um, they will assert uh, the need to continue funding these programs. Uh, I look forward to hearing their testimony. I also look forward to hearing what the um, Department of Energy has to say um, and uh, yield back the balance of my time. Uh, well, I, again, um, Mr. Simpson Brunner said as for the majority of the side, I would uh, like to take a quick recess for Mr. Simpson Brunner uh, to discuss this matter on, on the minority side and, and with the minority staff. Um, because, again, my understanding of what has happened um, is different from what Mr. Sensenbrenner just said. I'm not, I'm not accusing Mr. Sensenbrenner of misrepresenting the facts. I think perhaps um, our, our understanding is different. Um, and I would like to take a brief recess. And, if Mr. Chairman. Mr. And, and, I, and I also would like to inquire quickly. And we're looking at a really long hearing if we try to do everything in one day. Uh, the hearing in less than two weeks uh, is three panels of the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, this is today um, three panels, uh, if we count Representative Barrett. Um, <laughs> we, uh, I have a long uh, uh, line of questioning prepared that go to Mr. Barrett's credibility as a witness, but my staff has advised me that's probably not appropriate. Um, but for the other members who are, the other witnesses who are here, uh, I know it was not convenient to come to Washington. It would not be convenient to come back a second time. Uh, but what is your availability on August 1? Because I would rather have this hearing be about the decision and the conduct of the Department of Energy, not about procedural fairness. Um, what is your availability? How inconvenienced will you be? And I know you're all sitting on the front row. Could you, those who are test, uh, set to set, testify on later panels today, Mr. Birch, what is your availability on August 1? I'm sorry, what? Okay. Um, and Dr. Wicker? Dr. what? Schnorr. Dr. Schnorr? Yes, sir. Um, I, I yield to Mr. Hall. Chairman, you, and I, I appreciate your efforts to uh, approach fairness here. Uh, and there would be an opening statement that I would ask the permission to give in a little bit. We'll name other people that probably ought to be here that were really a part of the line there. Answer to the. Uh, Again, Mr. Hall, there will be a, a, panel, a hearing with three panels on August 1. Three and panels off from the Department of Energy on August 1. Yeah, well, I think there are at least maybe three other people from uh, the Department of Energy that were either uh, Rodman himself uh, or those that under his direction that, that have some uh, information that, that the chair would value, members of this uh, value in, in we, having at your decision. 
the reason, again, Mr. Sell was scheduled to testify today. Uh, it is his schedule, and I, yeah, and I, and I, and I recognize I'm sympathetic that. to his need to uh, attend the, the um, funeral of someone close to him. Um, but, but Mr. Sell was more than politely invited. Oh, I, don't, um, I don't question that. Uh, and, uh, I've, and these gentlemen have indicated that they could come back. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, the two witnesses who will testify to the value of the research at the lab, I, mean, I, I, I assume the Department of Energy, if they wish to tell their side of the story, it has to do with the negotiations with the lab about funding. Um, and for that, uh, Dr. Birch has said that he believed he could come back. Um, but it was the, the two um, scientists who are familiar with the work of the lab have traveled some distance to be here. Um, and we've heard one of them say that he would have to interrupt the family vacation to come back on August 1. I don't like to do that. Well, I wouldn't like to do that either. Um, Mr. Sensenbrenner, um, if, if Mr. Birch comes back and the testimony be to that, and I'm, and I'm not terribly concerned about Mr. Barrow's schedule, I believe he's probably going to be in Washington regardless. Um, uh, but the two scientific witnesses could testify today, and we could hold Mr. Birch to testify on August 1. It would be a long day of hearings. If, it, if the chairman would yield, I do yield. You know, uh, I don't think the issue is the scientific value of what has been done at SREL. Uh, uh, I can stipulate to the fact that uh, the scientific value uh, is there. Uh, the issue is why the DOE headquarters had a different view of the DOE personnel that were on site. And that's what we ought to be investigating. Now, you know, I would ask unanimous consent that the witnesses' prepared statements at the, today's hearings be included in the record. Um, and uh, if you know we want to get to the bottom of this, I think we ought to be looking into what went on at DOE headquarters um, uh, on this. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess you know my my point is is that uh, when Dr. Sell you know, could not appear because of uh, the necessity of him attending the funeral. Um, uh, there should have been sensitivity on the part of the majority staff to reach a decision on whether to go ahead uh, with this hearing before the witnesses uh, ended up leaving wherever they were to, to come to Washington, D.C. You know, I certainly don't want to inconvenience them, but I do want to make sure, you know, that we have a fair and balanced hearing. I thank the chair for yielding. Uh, if Dr. Birch can come back on August 1, I believe that the contested, the, um, the factual issues, contested, uh, disputed factual issues all have to do with Dr. Birch's testimony. It's true. Not with the testimony of Dr. Schnorr and Dr. Wicker, uh, who will testify to the value the sci of the scientific research done at this laboratory. Mr. Chairman, may I be recognized? Mr. Lamson. A request. Can we take a five-minute recess and, and discuss this? Uh, we can take a five-minute recess. The, the committee will be in recess for five minutes, subcommittees.
we're back in uh, order. Uh, the first I have heard from anyone, from the minority, from the minority members, from minority staff, from the Department of Energy, that there was any complaint at all about this hearing going forward was Mr. Sensenbrenner's opening statement. Uh, I am not hard to find. Uh, I have found Mr. Sensenbrenner on the floor uh, to discuss matters before this committee. Uh, I've tried to consult with him. Uh, I think that is a way to, to proceed in a, in a collegial uh, fashion, as cooperatively as we can. Uh, his locker is across from mine in the house gym. Uh, we see each other, we talk. The first I have heard of any objection at all to today's hearing uh, was in the opening statement. Now, uh, Dr. Birch has said that he can come back. Dr. Birch, your testimony is very important. We need you back. Uh, I believe that the only factually contested issues pertain to your testimony, Dr. Birch, uh, and we will take that up on August 1. Uh, the Department of Energy, uh, it was my personal experience, not just what I heard through staff, but my personal experience, because the Department of, of Energy has been less than cheerful in dealing with this issue. Uh, we need your documents. We need all that we've requested. Uh, we don't need them in dribbles and drabs. We need the rest of what we have requested. And we need them well before August 1 so our staff has a chance to review them thoroughly uh, so that everyone, the minority, is prepared to ask questions of Dr. Birch. Uh, we're prepared to ask questions of the Department of Energy. Uh, everyone is prepared uh, for the next hearing. Uh, but Dr. Per uh, Dr. Birch's panel today uh, will be postponed until August 1, which will be a long day. I also encourage the minority members to talk to the minority staff uh, because my understanding, again, of what has happened uh, with respect to this hearing is very different from what has been represented here. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, I will yield in a moment. Uh, and uh, it is the first that I've heard the Department of Energy objected in any way with going forward with this hearing as scheduled today. We will go forward on August 1. There will be four panels, the three that we've already scheduled, the, the, the representatives of the Department of Energy um, and Dr. Birch. And we will hear, hear the factual discussion of what happened, how the decision was made. Uh, today we'll hear from Representative Barrow, uh, and we will hear uh, from the two uh, scientific witnesses who can testify to the value of this lab's work. Uh, now, I now yield to Mr. Sensenbrenner. Well, uh, you know, let me say that it is not my intent to further inconvenience the two scientific witnesses, except to reiterate the point that the scientific value is not the issue that is in contention uh, that we are investigating. Uh, what I will say is that uh, I was not aware of Mr. Sell's personal problem where he had to leave town for a funeral until late last night or the first thing this morning. Uh, I was down in the gym this morning working out. Uh, uh, I didn't see the chairman there. But, you know, let me say in order to make sure that uh, we do have a complete record, it is my hope that on the August 1st hearing that in addition to Mr. Sell, uh, that the chair call Charlie Anderson, who is the principal deputy assistant secretary for the Office of Environmental Management, and Jill Siegel, who is the former assistant secretary of energy for congressional and intergovernmental affairs. Uh, she has left the DOE in April of 2006, uh, but um, uh, she was around and dealing with this at the relevant time when the decision was made. Um, I would hope that uh, if we are accommodating uh, to the majority and going ahead with uh, the hearing today, that they would be accommodating to us uh, and having uh, all three of these individuals uh, as minority witnesses. Uh, failing that, um, the minority will have no opportunity uh, except to invoke that part of the rule that allows for a minority day of hearings, and then we end up having three hearings on this, whereas if the majority were sensitive, we could have ruled this all into one, and I yield back. And, and Mr. Sinsenbrenner, um, all those witnesses are scheduled, as my understanding, are scheduled on August 1. So we should hear from everyone. If, if the minority has other witnesses to suggest, we certainly are willing 
uh, or, or we certainly will try to accommodate the, the uh, minority uh, and to have a procedurally fair uh, hearing. That our inquiry into this will be procedurally fair. That does not mean the Department of Energy will like the outcome, but we will, it will be procedurally fair. Um, and again, I am not that hard to find. Uh, my office has a telephone number. Uh, all the members have a directory of all of our office's telephone numbers. Um, I have a BlackBerry. Um, I actually read my messages somewhat compulsively, like most people who have BlackBerries. Um, I'm easy to find on the floor. Uh, it's not hard to find me. And I believe that our staff talks constantly. The minority and the, and the majority staff talk constantly. Mr. Lamson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to ex express my grin at, uh, at this. Uh, there hasn't been very much fairness uh, up to this point on uh, DOE, uh, and uh, there uh, has been there have been many things said and many actions made uh, that I, I, that many people are finding uh, absolutely abhorrent. Uh, SRL has been treated unfairly. I think they should be able to tell their story to as best as possible, get us prepared for those for those future hearings. Uh, it uh, it disappoints me to hear uh, the kind of things that we are hearing here uh, this this morning. Uh, to me, there has not been balance in the way uh, the budget uh, or the people at, at SREL have been uh, have been treated. The budget's been cut. People have been terminated. Jobs have been lost as of June the 29th, I believe. Uh, there's the potential for a significant amount of, of data that has been continuously gathered since 1951 uh, to not be able uh, to be gathered. And the longer that we wait before, as I said earlier, this mystery begins to unfold, uh, the harder it's going to be for it to be put back together again and the potential are valuing what is what is going to be uh, going to be potentially lost. Um, so if, if we if we postpone this based on a, a technicality, and I think that we were notified uh, on Wednesday, uh, the 12th of of, uh, of July, uh, that Mr. Sell would uh, have to be out of town for a, a funeral. Today is the 17th, so that was five days ago. Uh, I'm not going to say that there had been additional shenanigans being played, but I think that the question of fairness on the part of that agency to a lot of lives and to a lot of information that means a great deal to the lives of citizens across the United States of America uh, is, is at least questionable. Uh, Disappoints me uh, very significantly that an issue like this would be raised in the manner in which it has been raised. Uh, I, for one, am embarrassed with it, and I think that this committee should be. I'll yield back my time. I think uh, we've had opening statements of a sort from the chairs and the ranking members of both of the subcommittees. Uh, if any other member has an opening statement, we'll welcome that in writing for the record. Uh, and now uh, the chair will recognize uh, Honorable John Barrow, uh, who represents the district uh, that includes the University of Georgia, Georgia campus and the communities that border the Savannah River site, uh, who has devoted a great deal of, of his time and energy uh, effort to protect the lab's work and to ensure its future. And I want to thank him for bringing this, his role in bringing this to our, to the subcommittees, the two subcommittees' attention. And we look forward to his testimony today. And uh, Mr. Barrow, I'm somewhat disappointed. We usually place uh, witnesses under oath um, and remind them the penalties of perjury, but for whatever reason, we are not doing that with respect to you. Mr. Barrow. Uh, Better. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Miller. Thank you, Chairman Lamb.
we still don't have good sound. Yeah, check. Check. Not one thing is another. How about this? Is that better? All right. Well, that's what I want to start out with, but someone turn this away and turn that flip that other one on. Um, thank you all for, for calling this hearing. Interest of full disclosure, I don't represent the University of Georgia campus um, any longer, uh, but I do represent um, the part of this country that's probably most affected by the ongoing work. That is the entire um, watershed from um, the fall line at Augusta all the way down to the mouth of the Savannah River uh, at the city of Savannah. I share that uh, interest with uh, my colleagues in South Carolina, uh, Gresham Barrett, uh, Mr. English to, to a certain extent, and Joe Wilson down at the other end. Um, I want to I want to try and uh, put in my words what, what it is I think we're dealing with here, uh, what it is I think we have here, and what I hope we'll take away uh, from this. Um, first off, what, what we're dealing with here. Over half a century ago, our country embarked at the height of the Cold War. On a, on a technological uh, building boom to build uh, the weapons that we would use to win the Cold War. Now, we'd either use them by dropping them or use them by not dropping them. It was our fear that we might have to drop them, in which case we'd all lose. It was our hope and our expectation. If we had them, we wouldn't have to use them. And we embarked on a, on a building plan that rivals nothing that we've seen in this country before or since, and it took place at places like the Savannah River site, took place at Hanford, took place at Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, all over the country this was going on. Um, this was um, uh, a building program involved buying up a whole bunch of land, so we put buffers between the people and the work that was being done there. We're talking about dirty work that had never been done before, on a scale that had never been imagined before, with consequences we'd never faced before. And that's what we started to do about half a century ago. Um, it was all non-peer-reviewed work done by government contractors submitting the lowest bid. Uh, at the same time, there was a fellow who had a vision about how to deal with, at least to monitor this situation, his name was Eugene Odom. He was literally the father of modern ecology, wrote the book, practically invented the word, certainly as the guy who was responsible for um, uh, the words currency and usage uh, in, in, in everyday English. Uh, Dr. Odom had a vision. He had a, his vision was something along these lines. This is something that's worth watching, this is something that needs watching, and here's an opportunity to watch it that we've never had before. It's worth watching because we were involved in all kinds of dirty work on hundreds of square miles uh, astride of a, a, a watershed, and what was going on there wasn't just going on, it was going on all over the country. Now, Congress adopted this vision way back in 1972 when we first adopted the National Environmental Research Parks Program. The Savannah River site was the first National Environmental Research Park. This ain't a park like the kind of parks we're used to. This isn't a park where folks can go. It's a park where animals wander in and wander out. It's a park where water and the, and the ceaseless cycle of waters uh, comes and goes. Uh, it's a park that was supposed to be open to scientists, in the words of the uh, DOE, uh, as a protected outdoor laboratory where long-term projects can be set up to answer questions about what we're doing on this scale and in places like this. These are parks that are unique in the words of the DOE because they provide opportunities for research to study the compatibility of the environment with energy technology options. That's fancy words to decide to, to, to say. Can we survive doing what we're doing here? Are we going to kill ourselves in the process? Are we going to poison ourselves in order to keep ourselves from being blown up? Uh, now again, these are parks, but they're not real parks. These are parks that are closed to people, but supposed to be open to scientists. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is when the DOE talks in sort of, hor sort of fancy language about how these are places where we can a protected outdoor laboratory, this isn't a normative statement. This isn't what we ought to have. We're actually conducting great big old laboratories. These are laboratories, in fact, whether we like it or not. We're conducting experiments on a scale that have never been done before. The industrial generation of nuclear waste and it's ponding and pooling and amassing in these places, something that's never been done before. We're, in, we're experimenting like crazy in these seven places around the country. And whether or not we recognize it and treat it as a laboratory is up to us, but whether or not it really is a laboratory where we're doing things that have never been done before, playing God in ways that have never been done before, that's a fact. And Congress recognized that back in 1972. The only issue here, as I see it, is not whether or not scientists are going to be allowed to run the lab, it's still going to be run by bean counters accountable to politicians. 
The question is not whether scientists are going to be allowed to run the lab. The question is whether there are going to be scientists actually in the lab watching what's going on on a continuous basis. Now, these parks are, in the words of the DOE, a unique asset to the country. SREL is unique because it's the only institution in the entire country where we've actually been monitoring and treating it like a laboratory from the very get-go. It's the only place in the country where we have set data, to, data sets to use, to use the term of art, where we know what's been going and watching what's been going continuously from the beginning. And so it is unique. It has a unique role to play for, for all the others. It's also unique because it sits astride an ecosystem that has more complexity and more diversity than any of the others. If we can get it right, if we can understand what's going on in the euphemistically referred to southeastern mixed forest, swamp, pine, slash, you name it. If we can figure out what's going on there, we can figure out what's going on in shrub step. We can figure out what's going on in juniper pinion and grassland. We can figure out what's going on in all the other places where, environmentally speaking, it's a cakewalk compared to the complexity and diversity of what's going on in Savannah River. So what I'm trying to do is set the stage and point out that this, this has enormous implications beyond just the local. This isn't just a question, although it is a question, of the way we treat the employees and the loyalty and the support we give the folks that are doing this work. It's not just that. That's important to me. It's important to Gresham Barrett. It's not just important to the immediate environmental watershed of the Savannah River. That's important to me. It's important to Barrett. It's important to Inglis. And it's important to Wilson and the senators on both sides. It's about trying to maintain and, and, and monitor the lab in the one place where we've been doing this from the very get-go so that we don't lose sight of that vision. We've got to watch what's going on so we don't poison ourselves in the process of not blowing ourselves up. Now, what do we have here? What I think we have here... Uh, is a, a five-year plan to defund the SREL by folks who basically think it ought to be converted into any other kind of commercial contractor, sort of a gigantic surf pro bidding for some of the cleanup work at the, um, at the Savannah River site. Now, with all due respect to the surf pro folks, I, I, I acknowledge what they do, but this is not that kind of mission. This is not that kind of asset. It's not that kind of legacy. Um, what we also have here is a failure to communicate, and y'all going to get to that, uh, and, I, and I encourage y'all to get to the bottom of it. What I hope we'll take away from this, um, let's talk about what, what I want to take away from this, this, this series of hearings. This is not about the jobs in the area, although that's important. It's not about the immediate environmental impact, although that's important. And it's certainly not about Dr. Odom's legacy. That gentleman's country, I knew the man, he's the greatest man I have ever met the most un brilliant and unassuming person you will ever know. He's an amazing fellow, but his legacy is, is established far beyond our poor power to add or detract. It is about, though, the work of his hands, which is still running there, and which serves as the only institution that's been doing this work from the very beginning, and doing it in the one place where if, if you can do it in no place else, it's got to be done there for the benefit of all these national environmental research parks around the country. Um, it's about... Um, it's about trying to take our cue from Dr. Odom. If Dr. Odom did anything in his life, he helped us understand the connections between things and the importance of things that we took for granted and the importance of little things, little things that we, we didn't really think much about until they were gone. If we can take anything away from this, if we'd apply Dr. Odom's vision toward this problem, then the temporary elected officials who occupy this political niche and the temporary appointed officials who occupy this niche for the time being can preserve and protect something that we badly need everywhere. We ought to expand and have the, uh, an SREL in all of the national environmental research parks. That ought to be what we take from this is a commitment to expand this elsewhere. But if we can take his vision, the appointed officials and the elected officials who are occupying this little niche for just the time being won't destroy something that needs to be protected. We can actually preserve it, enhance it, and um, that, I think, is what we really need to do. Uh, I thank the chairman for, for the courtesy of allowing me to speak here. I thank you all for your, your stick to and um, I know I've talked too much. I will yield back whatever time I may have left. And that time is a negative five minutes. Um, <laughs> I, it is not typically a uh, uh, case that uh, members ask uh, questions of other members. Uh, but actually, I did ask questions of Mr. Hunter when he was here uh, a couple weeks ago. Does any member of the committee have a question of Mr. Mr. Barrow? If not, Mr. Barrow, uh, thank you very much. And I will not use the questions that I had going to the credibility of the witness. Uh, our next panel 
uh, we will see the testimony of Dr. Ward Wicker, the Emeritus Professor of Radiological Health Science at Colorado State University. Professor Wicker, uh, you, you can come forward now. Professor Wicker is uh, regarded as one of the founders of the field of radio ecology. Uh, he's had uh, more than 98 articles published in peer-reviewed journals. He is an honorary council member of the National Council on Radi uh, Radiation Protection and Measurements. Uh, he has also received the prestigious E.O. Lawrence Award in 1990 from the Department of Energy. Uh, and then the final witness, uh, Professor Gerald Schnorr. If you could take your seat here. Um, uh, Dr. Schnorr is a member uh, Dr. Schnorr is the Alan S. Henry Chair in Engineering at the University of Iowa. Dr. Schnorr is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a member of the EPA Science Advisory Board. Uh, he is the Editor-in-Chief of the journal Environmental Science and Technology. Um, as our witnesses should know, your oral testimony, your spoken testimony is limited to five minutes. Um, and the Chair may be a little more likely to enforce that uh, than I was with respect to Mr. Barrow. Um, and uh, after that, there will be um, there will be questions from any member of the committee. Uh, it is our practice, uh, typically, except when we're dealing with one of our colleagues, perhaps, to take testimony on an oath. Do either of you have any objection to uh, being sworn in, to, to swearing an oath? All right. Uh, you also have a, represent, a right to be uh, represented by counsel. Uh, or either of you represented by counsel today. All right, if you would please stand and, and raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Storr, you may begin. Chairman Miller and Chairman Lamson, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, Ranking Member Inglis, and Subcommittee Members, I thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the funding crisis facing the University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Laboratory located on the Department of Energy Savannah River site near Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, as the Chairman said, my name is Jerry Schnorr. I'm a professor at the University of Iowa and member of the National Academy of Engineering and I serve on the uh, U.S. Uh, EPA's uh, Science Advisory Board. As Editor-in-Chief of the leading journal in the field, Environmental Science and Technology, I manage the peer review process for thousands of scientific papers which are submitted each year, including several from Savannah River Lab. One of my personal areas of research is groundwater and hazardous wastes remediation especially phytoremediation, that's the use of plants to try to help uh, clean the environment. It's a promising long-term technology for some contamination problems at the Savannah River site as well. I did not have any public or private research grants related to Sorrel, stock or stocks, options held in publicly traded or privately owned companies, nor have I received any form of payment or compensation from any relevant entity connected with this testimony. Therefore, I hope and believe that I'm qualified to testify about the quality and importance of the scientific research being performed at the Savannah River Lab and its relevance to DOE's strategic initiatives. The information I am providing is based largely on my professional interaction with Sorrell faculty and a visit to the laboratory, a review of the institution's publication and history, and other DOE documents that are readily available in the public record. Due to time constraints, greater detail and additional supporting information and documentation has been provided in my written testimony, and I ask that it be read into the record. Since its founding in 1951, Sorrell's research emphasis has constantly evolved to meet the changing needs of DOE and SRS in particular, in my opinion, which is reflected in a, even a cursory review of Sorrell's scientific publications and their site reports. In response to a growing cost associated with environmental cleanups at DOD and DOE sites, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report entitled Groundwater and Soil Cleanup, Improving Management of Persistent Contaminants by the National Research Council in 1999. In the report, the committee clearly recognized the value of the Savannah River Ecology Lab, noting, 
Ecological risks are better characterized at the Savannah River site than at other DOE installations. Due in part to the designation of the site as a National Environmental Research Park and the presence of the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory. Despite such praise, the discussion concerning the current funding crisis has directly called into question the technical expertise of the Sorrell faculty and indirectly the overall quality and relevance of its research. First, I want to address some misconceptions concerning the type of research conducted at Sorrell. Over the last decade or so, there's been a clear shift in research emphasis at the lab with an increasing focus on contaminant fate and transport, largely in response to a more focused DOE cleanup mission. Sorrell faculty have demonstrated expertise in several active fields of research that are directly relevant to the Savannah River site remediation efforts. In addition to the clear practical benefit, Sorrell's support for the SRS pump and treat system resulted in four refereed articles in ESNT, my journal, two in a Beto Zone journal, one in groundwater, and one in the journal of contaminant hydrology. In addition, in addition, Sorrell researchers have developed three other patented technologies, including a system that combines both contaminant immobilization with phyto extraction, the use of plants. And they have submitted initial paperwork for an automated environmental monitoring system. The Savannah River Lab also plays an important role in regulatory process by providing independent scientific credibility necessary for site management to propose and receive approval for alternative cost-effective remediation strategies. In some instances, Sorrell faculty have been asked to accompany site contractors to regulatory negotiations in case certain questions arise for which their technical expertise is required. Mr. Chairman, my candid overall opinion is that the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory is providing the DOE and the nation with high quality research in a very cost effective manner. It's long been recognized as perhaps the foremost laboratory in terrestrial ecology in the country, and in recent years it's performing extremely useful research related to the fate, transport, effects, and remediation of chemical contaminants relevant to SRS. During the past 30 months alone, Savannah River Lab researchers have published eight rigorously peer-reviewed journals in ESNT, my journal, on nickel, uranium, mercury, radiocesium, and lead, all important contaminants at the site. In light of these accomplishments, I strongly believe that Sorrell's funding should be continued. The survival of the Savannah River Ecology Lab as an independent academic institution on the Savannah River site ensures that long-term management and remediation strategies and scenarios will be developed and implemented based on independent, verifiable science. Thank you very much. Dr. Wicker. Nine, nine. Okay. This is supposed to advance, but it's not advancing. I'm a professor emeritus at Colorado State University. Uh, I've been in the business of doing radioecology teaching and research for about 45 years now. My familiarity with the Savannah River Ecology Lab is, uh, stems from spending three years there doing research on my own full time. And I've had a number of uh, graduate students that have done their research there for their dissertations and theses. I think in the interest of time, I'll come back to this one. Uh, oops. The importance of the Savannah River site environment uh, is, is uh, important to recognize both scientifically as well as in other areas, educationally and so forth. The upper left slide is a aerial view of the Savannah River site taken from a satellite. It shows uh, mostly green surrounded by farmland and some urbanization. Uh, the large reservoir on the right hand of that 
green blob is the Far Pond, which I'm going to come back to in a moment. But when you're there as a scientist working, you would almost think that you're in a national park. Uh, it has a tremendously diverse wildlife, uh, and as, as many people said, it's uh, been a national environmental research park since about 1972. These and many other species live there, and they're exposed to contaminants that have uh, resulted from releases from the uh, nuclear reactors and uh, other industrial activities at the site. One of the main issues and things that the, the laboratory, uh, Savannah River Laboratory can do is that they uh, can, can get involved in, in the question about cleanup. Uh, the key to this is uh, determining whether cleanup is really needed at all, not necessarily how to do it unless it is important to do it. This requires uh, risk analysis and, and the sciences which, uh, which uh, underpin uh, the, the risk analysis. Cleanup costs, if you plot uh, the level of contamination versus cost, you have two distinct thresholds, the biggest one of which is when you decide to have uh, engineered cleanup. At that point, the costs go up by many orders of magnitude. And the SREL science uh, applies directly to that. Um, I want to give you a case history, if I can, of uh, Par Pond, because this is, a, I think, a, an example that, that really speaks to the, to the value of the laboratory. This is a large impoundment created for cooling reactors. It operated for about 30 years. Uh, and then it was shut down in 1988 because the reactors were shut down, but the reservoir was still there. However, there were some leaks in the dam, and uh, they decided that they needed to uh, figure out what to do. Uh, in order to reduce risk in case the dam should fail, they, they dropped the lake level 20 feet. This exposed cesium-137 contamination led to designation under under CERCLA that it, something had to be done. This required a, a, a management decision. Yeah, there were several alternatives of how to treat this, uh, ranging from draining the reservoir and breaching the dam and repairing the dam and refilling uh, uh, the reservoir to contain the contaminants. Uh, risk assessment, one risk assessment was done by an outside firm it was a paper assessment that said that it would be okay for somebody to farm the land. Uh, but SREL research uh, showed this not to be the case based upon actual data. It basically showed that cesium-137 has extremely high plant uptake and it moves into the food chain. And it would produce a lifetime risk to somebody living there that would exceed the EPA guideline of one chance in 10,000 of getting a cancer sometime in your lifetime. So. That was not an acceptable option. Uh, the, the two remaining options were to fix the sediments in place or to excavate it. Uh, there was no feasible way at the time to fix it in place. And so uh, one, one looked at carefully at uh, excavation. And uh, the cost of excavation of this reservoir was going to be $4 billion at least. So we came down to the best option to repair the dam and fill the reservoir at a cost of about $12 million. This is less than 1% of the excavation. Then the question arose is what about the health and, uh, of humans and <clears throat> ecological impacts of uh, allowing this contaminated reservoir even to exist? Well, the SREL research demonstrated that radiation dose rates to plants and animals were well below the applicable DOE standards. The radiation health risk to a hypothetical sport fisherman or hunter would be well below EPA standards, and there would be essentially no risk to other people using the, the reservoir. Also, for many years and decades of research on the reservoir, there was never any clear evidence of ecological impacts from either radiation or chemicals. And so that gave one comfort that uh, the radioactivity there was just there. It, it, it could be measured, but it wasn't causing any ecological damage. The outcome was that they did, uh, in fact, uh, repair the dam and refill the pond. It was essentially recovered in about five years, 
over four billion dollars was saved from this decision. Uh, the research that uh, that was uh, done to uh, lead to this outcome cost about two hundred thousand dollars, or eight hundred times less than the cost of, of that of dredging. In conclusion, um, I see I'm out of time. SARL should be funded, and I think even expand its role as an independent scientific organization. In fact, the SREL research has saved the government more money than it has received. Uh, this Parpond example, I think, proves that notion. Uh, a number of these other points have been made by others. Um, let's see if there's any here I should state. Well, I guess down to the very bottom line, uh, the funding required to maintain the infrastructure is, is relatively trivial. Trivial. The cost of uh, not not restoring this funding, I think, the costs of that are going to be extremely high. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we will open our uh, first round of questions, and the chair recognizes himself for uh, five minutes. First, Dr. Uh, Wicker. Uh, your example of remediation at uh, Parra Pond, uh, could a contractor have provided similar information to support uh, the option of remediation in place as opposed to excavation? They could not have come in and, and done, done the job very quickly. One of the key things was that uh, the observation of fish and wildlife in that reservoir had been going on for decades and the, the radioactivity had been there for decades. It was gradually decaying. Uh, if there were going to be effects, it probably would have occurred uh, 30 or 40 years ago. So, no, I don't think a, a, a private contractor could get them in and do, do the job properly. <clears throat> there was a, uh, a risk assessment done by a private contractor on what the risks would be of farming the lake bed and someone living on the lake bed. They're the ones that came up doing a paper study with the, uh, with the notion that, uh, yeah, it'd be safe to, to farm out there. But they didn't take any data. They didn't really factor in the increased mobility of cesium-137 in that particular kind of soil. So, and I, and I was told that that research cost about a million dollars. It was done very quickly and on paper. They never came to the site to look at it. Um, SREL is one of seven uh, national environmental research parks uh, associated with DOE installations in different parts of the country, different ecological zones. Um, what is the value of um, having uh, research in each ecological zone? Um, is, it, is it important that there be a network of sites um, to allow a kind of a regional understanding of ecological issues? And yes, it is. Uh, each of the DOE sites, the major sites, have uh, different kinds of uh, soil, and the type of soil determines the mobility of radionuclides and contaminants in that soil, uh, including how much is taken up into the food chain and thereby how much risk there will there be to someone uh, living on that, on that site. So yeah, it, it's important to do these kinds of studies at, at all the major sites. They all differ quite a bit in terms of their ecology and their, and their geochemistry. Um, what's the importance of longer term data uh, for reptiles, birds, amphibians uh, in deciding uh, which is, uh, in deciding on a credible uh, risk assessment for different remediation options, excavation versus remediation in place? Well, uh, the long-term aspect is uh, is important. It's uh, you know you can go out in the field and observe things in the field of ecology, but figuring out what's causing what is very very difficult. Uh, let's say you see a decline in a particular wildlife species, and you say, well, gee, is it because there's a little bit of uh, there's cesium-137 out there, or is it a natural cycle? Is it due to some other factor that we're not even aware of? Uh, ecology is a science that uh, has to be very innovative to try to figure out what causes what. You can observe things, but understanding the causes takes 
takes years, if not decades, of, of observation. Um, to set example to other members of the committee, I will uh, now yield to Mr. Lamson for his first round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Wicker and, and uh, a question or two. For, uh, radionuclides, nucle radionuclides uh, like cesium-137 and plutonium-239 are tainted in the environment for a long time. And although they attach to soil particles, they do move in the environment and sometimes are detected off-site. I understand that the monitoring of animals and plants helps us to understand those paths. If these substances move through the food chain, is it possible that larger, longer-lived animals carry this contamination off-site? And so is monitoring of birds, mammals, fish, and reptiles important from the perspective of ensuring the safety of, and, uh, and human health of people in surrounding communities? Uh, it is true that uh, animals, such as birds and fish, uh, do pick up contamination. And, uh, and yes, indeed, they can migrate off-site. Studies have been done at Savannah River Ecology Lab and at other sites and they generally show that just a very tiny amount of uh, radioactive or chemical materials actually get moved off-site uh, by immigration of individuals from the site. Uh, clearly, uh, observing uh, these pathways of contaminant transport uh, in animals and so forth uh, does tell us a lot about uh, what humans might be exposed to. Uh, and uh, a lot of the work that's been done there has e even been done in the, in the context of agriculture. It isn't just pure ecology that we're concerned about. It's uh, agricultural ecosystems, and we can learn about a lot about uh, that from the kind of work that has gone on at the Savannah River site. Uh, we planted uh, crops that people eat right on the Par Pond lake bed, for, in, for instance, and we looked at the uptake of uh, cesium and other radionuclides into corn and okra and turnips and lettuce and so on. And that would be something that a self-sufficient farmer uh, who might occupy that land uh, in the future uh, would be exposed to. Would both of you comment on this uh, question? Can natural attenuation be used safely as a remediation option if it is not coupled with the credible long-term monitoring program? By definition, uh, monitored natural attenuation includes long-term monitoring and, and modeling uh, to make sure that the contaminants aren't migrating off-site or posing an undue risk to uh, humans or to animals. So no, it cannot be done without long-term monitoring. And, and I might add that uh, the idea of monitored natural attenuation is a, is a very effective one. The, the wisdom of putting these DOE sites in, in large areas where there's a buffer zone has really uh, resulted in extremely small amounts of contamination ever getting off-site. That's not to say that none does, but uh, the the levels that do get off-site are extremely small because they do get tied up in, in the sediments. They're taken up in the, in the biota. Uh, actually, I can tell you that the presence of the Savannah River site actually uh, helps to improve both water quality and air quality for that whole region, as opposed to the idea if that whole area were, were say, uh, agricultural. Uh, the streams coming off the Savannah River site are largely black water streams. They're clear. Uh, they're generally avoid, devoid of uh, contaminants. Or if you look at the streams coming in to the river from the other side, where they're coming off farmland, is usually muddy and it, it's usually loaded with pesticides and that kind of thing. So I think the site uh, in, in, engenders a high degree of environmental quality that extends well beyond the borders of the plant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, instead of carrying over, my next question will be longer than five minutes, so uh, I'll yield back my time at this point. Thank you, Mr. Lamson. Uh, Mr. Simpson-Benner for five minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Uh, both of you, do you believe as a general rule that research funds should be uh, parceled out on a competitive peer review basis or by congressional or executive branch earmarks? I'm not sure I quite understand your point. If, if I understand it a little bit, uh, uh, the work that the Savannah River Ecology Lab does is submitted to peer-reviewed journals and so forth. It uh, has to go through peer re review before it can be published. However, it is not subject, uh, as far as I know, to uh, any kind of censorship from the Department of Energy. I'm, so I'm talking about the grants to do the research that result in the publication. Well, yeah, the grants that they get, uh, they have to compete for grants uh, when they go after funding that would come from uh, non-DOE uh, sources uh, or non-site, you know, it would be over and above their normal. Dr. Schmier? I, I agree that uh, funding should be uh, competitive. However, in the case of the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory, a certain base level of funding, I think, is necessary to keep the operation going and to uh, well, ensure and maintain the, the long-term research you know, I, I guess, research you know, I guess the, op the observation that I would make, uh, or make two observations, you know, one is, is that neither Colorado State University nor the University of Iowa, or for that matter, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, is able to get a specific line item from the DOE uh, for things that should be competitively peer reviewed. You know, that they have to you know, uh, basically uh, have their projects uh, compete against everybody else's, and if they end up losing out, uh, then those scientists are not funded by the federal government, and it's up to, in, that, in the case of uh, uh, each of these three institutions that I've mentioned, or for that matter, the University of Georgia, uh, to determine whether or not to use their own funds to get from the legislature to, to continue that base. And I guess my question is, is why should ASRL be treated differently in terms of competitive peer review funding for this type of research uh, than most of the other institutions in the country when they compete for scientific research grants? The Savannah River Ecology Labs, their research is peer reviewed and, and my testimony... No, I'm talking about, you know, this is after the research is done. I'm talking about... About the award. About the, about the award because you know, with, with you at the University of Iowa, uh, you don't get the award, you don't do the research unless you get the state legislature to decide to fund it. Now, you know, why shouldn't the same hold true uh, with research that's done at S SREL, where if they don't get the award, then it's up to the Georgia legislature to determine whether or not to continue the funding? A certain amount of funding is necessary at these uh, laboratories just to keep the doors open and to keep base level research going. Mm -hmm. Then they should compete and do compete for out for other well, outside I, funds. I, I guess neither of you get my uh, point. And you know, I'm trying to see why SREL ought to be dealt with differently in terms of funding for the basic research than practically every other institution in the country, whether it's a state university or whether it's a private university. Uh, everybody else rolls the dice uh, with competitive peer review grants and they've got to do it year after year after year and if they don't win the competitive peer review grants uh, then they either go to the legislature or fold up shop. What's different about SREL? I, I, I'm trying to uh, answer your question um, and that is that at, at research laboratories and SREL is no different than other EPA or DOE uh, laboratories, you need a base level of funding to keep the mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure, the, the research operation going. And that's really what we're talking about here, and a rather, in, in my opinion, a small amount of funding. Well, also, $10 million is really quite small considering the quality and level of research that's well. going on at SREL. But why should SREL get a line item and the University of Iowa doesn't? Well, the SREL gets a line item just like all the other national research laboratories. No, I'm saying, but why should they? Uh, because a peer review committee might decide that uh, research that's done not at a national research laboratory has a higher priority for funding than SREL. 
I understand your question, and of course, at the University of Iowa, we would love to have a, a, a line item funding also, but we are not a, a national right. laboratory right. Lo located in one of but those. But Dr. Schnur, my time is up. You know, my, my point is, is turning the coin over, you know, and that is, is that uh, I know you'd like to have, you know, a line item of funding, but why should SREL's line item of funding take away the potential of you getting more because your peer review uh, uh, research proposal is determined to be better by the committee? I yield back. Mr. Bartlett for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is it your uh, understanding that, uh, generally speaking, in the uh, community at large, in the scientific community, and in the medical community, that the lower the level of radiation, the better? Um, yes, the, the lower the better. You agree, Dr. Schnur? Yes, there, there's a, in, in certain types of health outcomes, health effects, uh, it's still thought that even a, a single uh, bit of radiation could be enough to uh, begin the disease process. Are you familiar with Hans Selye? That name mean anything to either one of you? Could you, could you pronounce it again? Hanselye. H-A-S-S-E-Y-L-E. -E. No, was a, uh, one of the early investigators from uh, Montreal, Canada, I believe, in stress. Uh, I'm 81 years old, so my uh, uh, work in the scientific community is 50 years old and more, and so he is back in history. <laughs> but he was the first investigator to uh, to uh, uh, begin to understand the uh, role of stress in the body. I wish I had uh, uh, come prepared with the actual data, but there, there is uh, scientific evidence that appropriate levels of radiation are beneficial. Because what they do, like any other stressor out there, they challenge the body's defenses. And they, these defenses are marshaled so that we are then better able to withstand other stresses. I know that your perception is a perception of, uh, of the general community, and it should not be the perception, I think, of the scientific community, particularly the medical community. Uh, you know, uh, radiation is just another stressor. As far as I know, there is nothing unique about that. And I think that we are, are, are spending excessive amounts of money in, in cleanup, which with a hard look is really silly. It's just another stressor. Water is a, is a great absorber. Your observation that refilling the, 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 the impoundment was the right thing to do, it doesn't take much water to absorb this radiation. And the organisms living near it are probably better off for the moderate levels, the appropriate levels of radiation they're getting because, because their resistance is built up. The body's defenses work that way. What do we have to do so that uh, we change this perception that the less, the better. I don't believe that, that radiation is a unique stressor. I don't think the scientific evidence indicates it's a unique stressor. And we just are, are straining it in that and, and spending all sorts of money we don't need to spend in cleaning up the last vestiges of, of this contamination. All of the, of the ground in, in these cleanup areas don't have to be appropriate for establishing a daycare center maybe where the kids may sit and put dirt in their mouth. But and that's the rules, that's the rules that we adhere to. And I think we were spending at least an order of magnitude too much money in cleaning up these sites because we don't understand the science and the physiology and the medicine. Well, I, I agree with you. And in fact, uh, my written testimony has a, an article uh, published in Science that uh, says basically what you are saying. The thing of it is, is that it, uh, it takes a lot of... Um, science to demonstrate what you are talking about and oftentimes to convince the, regu the regulatory community and the public that uh, cleanup may not always be warranted because the damage can be great, the cost can be high. Uh, the, the notion of uh, a little bit of radi radiation being good for you, that's a well-known phenomenon called hormesis and that has received a great deal of attention uh, over the years. Of course, we live in a radiation environment. We're sitting here right now, and we're getting a, a fair amount of radiation just because uh, our environment 
cosmic radiation, uh, radioactivity in the Earth's surface that has been there since the Earth was formed. And so, uh, but the, uh, the way that I answered your original question uh, is that for the purposes of radiation protection, uh, they assume that uh, the dose and, re and response to that dose is a, is a linear uh, phenomenon, uh, but uh, there, there's evidence. That the trouble is there is not consensus on that, and getting the data to pin it down at the very low doses is very difficult. Yeah, I don't know of any evidence that says that this is not true. Well, uh, thank you very much. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. Uh, I'll now recognize myself for an additional five minutes for a second round of questions. Uh, Mr. Simpson-Brunner's questions regarding peer review, I think, foreshadows the testimony on August 1. Uh, both of you are involved in scientific research and are familiar with what is involved in uh, what, what is required, typically, a peer review, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, my impression of peer review for a grant is that the grant application is very thorough uh, in the information called for, uh, in the information that the uh, applicant uh, must provide. Uh, is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I, I might add, uh, Chairman Miller, that there are grants that are uh, competitive. Right. And there are grants that are uh, part of a mission agency, right? And um, I, I think that, uh, but with respect to peer, you need both. You need to, both kinds to make of a judgment grants. by uh, to allow a judgment by others expert in the same field. Uh, would it typically be the case that the information requested would be very thorough, and would be the information needed uh, to review? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, if. Dr. Birch testifies on August 1 um, that the information required of him was a sentence or two description of the work they plan to do. Does that sound to you like the information usually required for a scientific or technical peer review? No. no. Okay. Um, and uh, a second question about peer review uh, with respect to peer review, what kinds of documents does it generate? Are there memoranda describing the failings uh, of the proposal uh, if peer review is critical? Um, what, are, there, are there documents typically generated as a result of peer review? Are you talking about in, in applying for research money? Well, in, in making the publishing? decision. So whoever makes the decision with respect to uh, peer review, uh, it, are there not generally documents generated as a result of peer review? Uh, Memoranda, uh, uh, letters, something that would say what exactly uh, the, the reviewer was looking for, um, or if the reviewer found something wanting, exactly what was wanting. Well, sometimes the uh, person who submits the grant proposal will, will hear about those things and they will get some communication back, but not always in my experience. Sometimes. You just find out that you don't get funded, but you never hear about why. But normally, I would say you, as a one who proposes for research funding, you do receive uh, letters of review back from um, uh, panels who have looked at your research, and those those are remain anonymous. You don't find out who who they were, but you do okay. get to see. Well, that's that's what you, you see as, as, as having applied for a grant that that's subject correct. to peer review. But um, internally, whether you see it or not, would you expect there to be some document of some kind that sets forth what the failings were that led to the denial of funding? Yes, uh, that would be my uh, okay. belief, yes. I would think so as well. And the Department of Energy has no documents uh, that really reflect a peer review, uh, uh, an analysis of the work done at the Savannah River, the SREL, uh, ecology lab, uh, then perhaps there was not a genuine peer review. Is that? I don't speculate. I, I, I couldn't speak for the Department of Energy. I can say that their papers from the Savannah River Ecology Lab have been peer reviewed. Right. They're technical scientific papers. All right. Um, Dr. Schnorr. Um, 
we still have Superfund sites. We are still cleaning up. Um, the the sites are on federal and private lands throughout the country. Um, are, are the studies that have been done at SREL uh, applicable to, the re to remediation of environmental damage in other areas? Yes, I think my testimony shows that uh, most of the papers, especially recently, are related to the problems at the Savannah River site. But certainly these problems are shared by many other sites and the research is applicable uh, broadly. What is the status of our developing the technologies uh, to uh, clean up safely uh, environmentally contaminated uh, sites, particularly DOE sites, particularly radiation sites uh, where the contaminant is radiation? Especially where you have mixed wastes, that is both uh, radio contaminants as well as uh, other uh, contaminants together. These, these are considered to be among the more difficult sites to clean up and proportionately more of those remain than other sites. How are you, would you evaluate SREL as a candidate for undertaking uh, further research into remediation uh, as a technique for, for cleanup based upon your experience with that lab? I, I think this lab is performing uh, extremely well considering the rather small number of faculty uh, involved in research there and the small uh, federal funds and state funds committed to it. All right. Um, I, th I think we, we throw away uh, we throw around terms like all of us know what they mean um, uh, on this hearing. I think in hearings like this, where uh, members were not uh, willing to betray their general ignorance of the science. But what what are fate and transport studies? Or am I part of the question in here? Yes, either one of you. Yes, sir. Dr. Well, fate deals with uh, where contaminants go once they're released, uh, usually either to air or water. In other words, <clears throat> let's say you put a contaminant into water, it's, it's, some contaminants will stay in the water, but most of them will, will uh, stick to soil particles, salt particles, uh, phytoplankton, little organisms in the water, then they might move through the food chain or they might not, depending on their chemistry. So that's what we mean by fate. What happens to it? Where does it go? And in transport, is that different? Was that part of fate? Well, it's the same thing. The transport is sort of where it goes, and yeah. fate is sort of what happens to it along the way. Yes. Okay. Uh, is a, a knowledge of uh, where contaminants go and what happens to it, uh, is that uh, important beyond cleaning up on site? Would that be important, for instance, in uh, any, any kind of activity at a contaminated site that disturbs the soil, construction activity, for instance? Oh, yes, it's extremely important. And in fact, there are cleanups that have been done in the DOE complex that the cleanup itself generated dust and that dust blew off site and that led to a multi-billion dollar lawsuit. This was at Rocky Flats. I think that is all the questions um, that I have and since that's all the questions I have, that's all the questions that any member has. Uh, but thank you for being here uh, today. Uh, we will have a second panel on August 1. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Birch, we, this will be your second trip to Washington. Um, I understand that you have time on your hands now, <laughs> uh, but, I, but I appreciate and apologize uh, for your coming today uh, without testifying. Uh, we will try to accommodate your schedule on August 1, uh, let you testify first, and get on with your day. Uh, with respect to the Department of Energy witnesses, um, I strongly urge all the witnesses not to take lunch plans, uh, not to make dinner plans. Uh, we will continue until we have completed the testimony scheduled for August 1. Um, the uh, best predictor of what uh, a hearing, an investigations and oversight hearing will be like, uh, how searching the questioning will be, um, how thorough it will be, is how motivated uh, the members are and the staff is. Uh, I think you should assume that the staff and the members 
will be very motivated on August 1. Um, with no further business, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>